there are many different ways which DNA can be inserted into cells. And some of these have been tried and over time they work extremely well. This particular one is called electroporation. In electroporation, an electrical field is applied to the cells that creates little holes in the walls and the membrane. Then DNA from another source can get in. When we think of this, well, wait a second, how would that ever happen in nature? You have to remember that a lot of things we do in nature really depend on electrical fields that are applied to cells. There is the possibility of natural events like lightning, which could get into the soil, create a small electrical field DNA that might be present in the soil, would be able to be picked up into the cell. This could happen naturally. This also can occur in a laboratory. In the end, you get new DNA into the cell, therefore you have a recombinant cell. Another method that we have here is what is called protoplast fusion. In protoplast fusion, enzymes are used to remove cell walls. You have to look at bacteria or plant cells or fungal cells. There are enzymes which break down the cell wall. You use the enzyme to break down the cell wall. Now you've got a cell that is devoid of wall or just as membrane. These are called protoplasts. When a protoplast is placed in a solution that contains polyethylene glycol, the protoplasts will come together, they will fuse. What will happen is the DNA and the two chromosomes will commingle and get stuck together. You will now have new DNA inside of the cell. When this cell goes to reproduce, it may carry on some of those traits that you want. In that particular case, we have a new cell. Protoplast fusion is used in a lot of different things. This shows plant protoplasts where the cell wall has been removed. You can see the protoplasts in there have chloroplasts. By placing it in polyethylene glycol, it will cause them to come together and form one cell. This is probably the most unique way. This goes back quite a bit, and this really started out as taking a gun, a 22 caliber blank shell, which means there's no bullet in it, creating a little chamber which it could be fired out of. The DNA would be placed on little beads that would be extremely tiny. It would be placed on a nylon projectile. The blank shell would be fired. That would cause the projectile to go at a very high speed until it hits a plate that would stop it. The little pellets that have the DNA on it would go flying out. They would land inside of a cell. They would pierce a cell. The size of these pellets is extremely tiny. It's not like it was some sort of large thing. It has to be very tiny so it really doesn't disrupt the cell itself. The modern way of doing this uses a gun that looks like this. This is basically pneumatic where it's going to be pressed along by air pressure. And it would work in virtually the same way. You can see in this particular case they have the mark where they want to put in this new material. You can see the little brown spot in the center of the mark. That would be where the pellets were shot in. Some of these are going to get into these particular plant tissues. We can use that in order to modify plants or plant cells with genes. Then we could take these plants, remove cells from them, and grow new plants from them. Another method is what we call microinjection. In this particular case, you've got a target cell in there with a the nucleus. This shows a micropipette that contains DNA in it that is inserted into the cell, and the DNA is then placed into the nucleus. You can see a suction tube that is in place to hold the target cell in place. By doing this, you can actually add DNA or subtract DNA from a particular cell. This is called microinjection. This is often visualized as in vitro fertilization. The process is actually called microinjection. Here is another picture. You can see how it takes a very tiny piece. It penetrates into this cell. I would imagine that this is actually a human ovum. You can see the outer gelatinous layer around the outside that has been pulled away from this. It allows for manipulation of whatever genes you've got on the inside. One of the concepts is, is to be able to do these sorts of things so that we can create plant that will produce something that we can use. This concept here would be taking a vaccine and placing it into something like a chocolate, which then could be consumed. By doing that, you would transmit the recombinant vaccine to the individual that you were trying to help. What you see here is the mechanism by which 
a lot of plants are modified when they want to insert a gene into it. You can see over here we have a bacterium. The bacterium is called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. Inside of the Agrobacterium tumefaciens, there is a plasmid that's called the Thai plasmid. Thai plasmid makes Agrobacterium tumefaciens pathogenic to plants, where the bacterium actually comes in contact with the plant tissue and the plasmid is transferred into the tissue of the plant. What has been done is they remove a gene, they snip the Thai plasmid with a restriction enzyme, then they add a gene in from another organism using the same restriction enzyme. They snip it so they can get the little piece. This puts the gene of interest into the Thai plasmid. Thai plasmid is then reinserted back into the bacterium. Bacterium is placed in contact with the plant. The next thing you know is you get transfer of the plasmid from the bacterium to the plant. As you get this transfer, the gene now becomes part of the genome of the plant itself. Itself. At that point, we now have a modified plant. We would call this plant transgenetic. And whatever characteristic was on that gene now becomes part of that plant. This is the way they modified cotton in order to be able to have cotton less susceptible to things like the boll weevil. And this is the way they have tried to modify plants to do things like put oils and put vitamins in it, modify it along those lines. This is an excellent example of genetically modified plants. You can see a genetically modified papayas on the right hand side. They look very healthy. They look very large. They look quite good. The non-genetically modified papayas on the left look like they are diseased. They are not thriving. This particular case, there is a virus that attacks papaya. And what they did was they took part of the protein of the viral coat. They placed it into the plant cell. By doing that, the plant produces the protein, which means if the virus comes along, the virus can't find any receptors on the cell to be able to go anywhere. So the virus is null and void, so to speak. In this particular case, you can see how this looks like it worked out very well. There's a lot of controversy over whether or not we should be doing this. When we look at it, that is something that each individual is going to have to think about on their own. When we deal with genetic modification, there are many different methods that we can use. And in the end, the whole concept is to take genes and place those genes into the plant or the bacterium or whatever cell it is so that that cell would have the ability to do what those genes permit it to do.